Hello and welcome to the Ask the Industry podcast, episode 30. For those of you new to the show, this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand-up, comedy, radio, TV and today, competitions. James Alderson founded the South Coast Comedian of the Year competition when he couldn't find any spots in his hometown of Portsmouth. It's a really interesting interview. I've So far, most of the people I've met who have set up competitions have been uh, other industry people. So it's interesting to meet someone who is a comedian who is trying to do something to help other comedians out. We talk more about the sponsorship for the award, what the award can do for you, how to enter the award. Uh, The awards actually should be open at the time of publishing. I'm publishing this in September 2015, so I'm hoping this isn't going to date the podcast. Like, in five years' time, someone listens back and goes, oh, God, this is such an old episode. Hopefully it's still evergreen, because I feel like it's a really good episode and it's not going to date anytime soon. He also is a comedian in his own right, as I've said, and he went full-time, in his own words, within the first two years of performing. We discuss how he did that, um, how you can do that, and the realistic path that you need to take to do that, and the constraints and flexibility that that offers for someone in his position. He's a family guy, he's got kids, he left a very nice job that he was doing very well in in order to pursue comedy. I think it's, I think it's a great interview. I think you're going to get loads out of it. I'm not going to say much more except thank you so much for the reviews. You're up to 34 now. Please keep them coming. If you haven't already done that, go to iTunes. Just chuck, chuck it whatever star rating you honestly think it's worth. Uh, four and five would be the best, obviously. But uh, whatever you think it's worth would be great. Also, if you could leave it a little bit of a written review, that would be amazing. Because, as I say all the time the future guests are reading those and uh, it'd be great to have some new ones up there also quick shout out to james quinton he was instrumental in getting this podcast up and running he is a ninja when it comes to audio and visual editing and if you need any help with anything from a professional um do contact him he runs a company called the headquarters and uh i will link to him in the show notes for this podcast as well as I have a list on the Facebook group called Friends of the Podcast. He is in there, so if you want to find him. uh, He's also a comedian in his own right and runs a podcast himself, which is called Can I Be Funny? And that's worth looking up as well. So if you'd like to support the people that supported this show early on, uh, please do. He's been really helpful in terms of showing me how to edit stuff and set up mics and all kinds of stuff. He's He's just amazing. Do support him if you ever need someone. He's also recorded some shows... Um, like video and audio and then done the editing for those comedians so they can put them up to sell online now if you're one of these comedians who wants to do something like that he's worth talking to because he's got experience in that and I can vouch for him and I would say that he's amazing so do talk to him very quickly very quickly if you're enjoying the shows and you'd like to support me please go to the website which is simonkane.co.uk then you can find uh, a paypal button chuck me whatever you think it's worth uh, also, if you want to support me on an ongoing basis, you can become a patron from $1, uh, which is about 80p. So uh, if you would like to do that, that'd be amazing. And uh, you also get exclusive content for being part of the patrons and all kinds of stuff like that. So please do consider signing up for that. Uh, it's uh, You only, only make three pods a month, so it'll cost you about £2.40 to keep this project going. And uh, it's really, really helpful. Honestly, gives me a budget. It saves me a lot of aggravation and <laughs> calms down a bit of my anxiety, which... If I'm honest, there's a lot of. So if you can help, please do. Finally, if you like this episode, please do share it with a comedian or a performer or a friend that you think will enjoy it. It, I think it would be perfect for anyone on the South Coast who is looking at doing the competition or anyone who has been going on the circuit for a little while and is looking at trying to go full-time or more full-time and wants to know someone else's story of how they did that. Also, it would be useful for any new comedians who are wondering how hard or how difficult or how easy it could be to go full time. The answer is it's not easy, but the way that he has handled it and the professional manner in which he's marketed himself and been persistent means that he has quote unquote made it in a way that some people are still struggling to do. So I think it's a great, I think it's a great episode. Without any more delays, this is James. I remember searching and not being able to find anything when I first started, so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Well, that was four and a half... Well, it was about five years ago in the summer that I decided to start um, comedy, and, you know, it was a Googled open mic comedy nights, and nothing came up. 
<laughs> right. You know, for Portsmouth or Hampshire, I tried Sussex and I found one eventually. And after about three or four months of getting the guts up, I went and did the first open mic night in Worthing. Um, but, you know, off the back of that, a few years later, I just thought, I wonder if it's any different really for comedians right down on the South Coast um, if they want to get into anything. And it wasn't really. There wasn't really any more open mic nights at all for anybody. Um, so they're having to travel all over, unlike in London, where you can. One, do one tube stop properly and do three more open mic nights. It's, I don't know how often you gig in London. <laughs> Never. It doesn't, they are all over the place, but there's a, the problem is, is that, okay, the, the problem in London is that every pub has a function room. This yeah. is the Victorian era. And they all had, you know, they basically went there and did their business, but they don't use that for that anymore. So there is a room that is perfectly out of the way to do comedy in, in most pubs. Yeah. That means there is an open mic gig at every tube stop. That doesn't mean there's a paying progression. No, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's why I gave up. Because for about three or four months, um, four years ago, I did do the five, six, seven minute spots in London. And I just thought, you know, this is almost six hours door to door for me, round trip. What am I doing? And like you say, you can't. You can see that there's no progression. You see that there's you, somebody might spot you and give you another five minute spot, another open mic night. But um, I didn't really see that there was going to be much chance of me making any waves doing that. So, um, so yeah, you know, the chance of doing a competition like this for for newer acts down here and give them a little bit of a chance of progression and a title and prize, you know. Well, before we talk about the competition. Portsmouth itself is quite a uni town. Yeah. Do you think bars make more money out of uni crowds that want to get drunk than entertainment then? Has that affected it? Um, I don't think it's affected it. I just think that they, like a lot of towns, really keep within their own sort of events and their own circle of life. You know, there are there is definitely a part of Portsmouth that is university and there's other parts of Portsmouth that aren't and you don't get as many um, students around those parts so I don't know they have their own comedy um, I think social group there in the university and their own comedy night I think Um, they do spread out around the city I don't think it's hindered it or helped it really they keep themselves themselves a lot of the time is it hard to you for you I mean I don't know how old you are but is it hard for you to get on the student circuit of that Uh, I don't I mean, I wouldn't try to, I don't think, really. Um, <laughs> they don't want some 40-year-old bloke standing up there telling them about stuff. Maybe they do. Um, I mean, I, you know, I do uni gigs, not in Portsmouth, but I've done uni gigs and gigs where it's predominantly students and you just find a way to connect. But um, it's not something that I crave after in Portsmouth anyway. Um, there are other gigs locally now as a pro act that you can get on uh, and, and perform at within sort of 10, 20-mile journey. So... Go for go for where I'm going to be most successful, <laughs> and that's not Portsmouth at all. I mean, there's, you, you run you run clubs in Portsmouth. Yeah, right? I run one at the Spinnaker Tower, um, which has been going a couple of years. There is obviously the Jonglers um, right in the middle of the marina there at Gun Wharf, uh, Wedgwood Rooms, which is run by Off the Curb, which has been going for twenty years. There's a little one in the cellars, which is where we run the heats um, for the competition, um, and there's a few. You know, just off the island, sort of five, ten miles away from the city centre. So it's not horrific, but it's definitely a lot quieter than most. I mean, it's the most densely populated city in the country, and it's in a you know <laughs> five square mile space of land. So it should have loads, but you know, it's just the way it's gone. I suppose I don't really know. It's... I mean, it seems weird to me. I mean, I, I mean, London, like you said, there's gigs everywhere. So you would think. I mean, are there less comedians here then? Yes, yeah. No, I mean, not than London, I mean just in general, like, as a per capita, would you say there? I would say there is, yeah. I mean, the first um, the first comedian I came across was Joe Wells, um, who's from here, and Simon Fielder, uh, who went to my school from here, Mike Wozniak, who went to my school. Um, not all comedians from Portsmouth went to my school, but, you know, it was just, it's just the way I stumbled across them. Um, quite a few amateur acts are coming through, but that's probably, again, the last sort of two or three years when we've tried to get things a bit moving comedy-wise in the city. Um, I'm trying to think if I've forgotten anybody and offended anybody. but um, I, think, away. I think Mike, Simon and Joe, myself, are the only pro acts from the city, and I think that really reflects how you know, intense comedy is. In the, you know, 
there's nothing really down here um, in this part of the world, really. Why? And I'm aware you have kids and a family, mm. but why would you stay in Portsmouth if there's not that many like opportunities for you to make money? If that makes sense. Yeah, there, you shouldn't really. Uh, if you're going to be a comedian, you shouldn't. I mean, if you want to really, you know, break it, you've got to go to somewhere where it's all happening. You know, and it's definitely happening more in the Midlands and and London. And you know, an agent isn't going to trip. You know, travel down on a Wednesday night to come and see me if I was performing in Portsmouth. Not that I do. I spend most of my days travelling hundreds of miles. But um, if you haven't got any um, any kids or responsibilities, then like most comedians, you, you just go where you need to go for your career, don't you? Um, but uh, for me, yeah, kids in school, wife with job, you know, and uh, bills and all the other boring things that happen with bills. You just have to stay where you are. But Travel is part of it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we were talking before about how... Because every gig I do in London... Because I, I live either far out west or far out northwest, depending on whether I'm at, where I'm staying that yeah, night. Yeah. And usually that means I have an hour's journey regardless through London. Oh, yeah. And you were talking about how you could use that hour and go to Reading or yeah. Oxford and do a paid gig. Oh, yeah. No, I... I I was chatting to Sarah Callahan about this um, on Wednesday night, and it was a Clapham gig, and she lives over in um, West London, far West London, and exactly the same discussion happened. You know, she can travel for an hour to get across London, or you're trying to get out of London, and in which time I can be, you know, nearly at Oxford or you know halfway to Exeter, and it's and yeah, like you say, not to do a five spot, to do a twenty five minute spot, nicely paid, you know, well on my way, so. Um, some of my mates who live in London Friday, they have to leave lunchtime to get out of London to get up to Northampton or whatever just to avoid all the traffic and I can be there and avoid most of that in two and a half hours so it comes with its benefits when I first started everyone said you've got to move from Portsmouth, you cannot stay it, you're never going to be able to go and do anything in comedy all the way down there but it's it, yeah, I, I'm getting uh, I'm travelling all over the place doing exit all over the country and I've not got any regrets for staying put really no fair enough uh, <laughs> I wasn't trying to secretly convince you you'd made a <laughs> come away with me James <laughs> <laughs> come to London we have open mic um, well, I mean, it sounds like you're doing quite well and, and when I asked for people to come on this you, you were pretty much everyone's first choice but that might be because there's only three people here <laughs> I'm questioning whether three I'm, comedians in Portsmouth. You've picked the wrong one. I'm no. questioning whether I picked the wrong one. <laughs> but it's uh, to me. Uh, I mean, okay. You. I mean, you. Your website says you're with Red Twenty Four Management for um, for acting and stuff like that, not yeah. for live gigs. Yeah, I was going to say, and th- that interests me. So you went full. Or you went pro last year, according to your website. Uh, oh, is it? Well, it was the year before that. But yeah. I've only got Google. No, that's <laughs> fine. Two two years ago, yeah. Uh, okay, so you went you went pro two years ago. Yeah. So that was after two years of doing the circuit. Yeah, yeah. So that means, in layman's terms, for for because in London that means you have a fifteen to twenty minute spot set that works ninety percent of the time. You know, you're not going to win every crowd. No, but no. Ninety percent of the time, you've got this twenty spot that works. Yeah. Most comedians in London, partly because of the circuit that is not conducive to it as it were you know you do five minute spots all over the place you're not going to be able to build a 20 or whatever Mm. how did you get to a stage where you knew you had something that was viable enough to go out and say to promoters i've done i've got this for you to sell as it were that's a good question i don't think you i don't think you truly know do you in your head that it's a sellable um 20 minutes until you're forced into the situation of doing 20 minutes over and over again and you push yourself to do those 20 minutes and you take on those 20 minute spots for whatever people are happy to pay you and slowly that that fee builds when you become as you say uh, you get a better hit rate um like we've touched on before you know i'm no spring chicken so i put myself under the pressure to try and you know time's ticking it's just moving and i've got i'm you know i saw the um, 40 years um (laughs) the flag ahead of me and I'm thinking I've got to get this I've got to get this under my uh, I've got to get this sorted I've got to 
um, wrap this 20 minutes up, 15, 20 minutes. So I was just chasing and chasing every promoter I could just to give me more chances and more chances and more and, and more trust. And I will say that it all started predominantly with all the independent clubs, you know, the small clubs. So like you say, the function rooms in pubs, whoever would take me on and the lower pay middle spots like you have to do. But, um, you know, you keep, you keep knocking on the doors and slowly you get people to open them, don't you? Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> well, as you say, you've got to have a, you've got to have ninety percent of the time. It's got to be going well, but you know. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, the interesting thing about meeting you properly is you've been doing this roughly the same amount of time I have. I've been chasing an audience to do shows to, and it feels like you've been chasing club circuit stuff instead. Is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So yeah. it's and I'm not as commercially viable as you are right now. Okay. So I'm sort of looking at what I could have done. <laughs> well, no, because you know, I that I'm when I first started getting paid stuff, a lot of my mates were like asking the same thing, you know, what are you doing to and I was I came from a sales and marketing background, you know, before I started comedy. So I guess I was slightly more sort of um bolshy about uh, not cocky, but just going and saying, you know, can I do a gig? I'll do any, you know, uh, um, and show them a clip and whatever, and just push myself onto people. Try not to be too pushy, but just asking the questions as often as I could, and I, I because I was under pressure to get get some money if I was going to justify doing it with these two little sprogs running around my ankles, and I'm leaving them at bedtime four nights a week. You know, I'm not going to do it for nothing. So uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, just any gig that cropped up, I asked them for a spot. Wherever I could, I guess, like we all do, really. But um, it's uh, just a pr- my own pressure that I put on myself. Yeah, if there's one thing I've learned from everything I've done in the last four years, it's predominantly comedians are lazy, and unless they pressure themselves or have someone do it for them. So, uh, for example, I saw someone put something up on Facebook a couple of days ago that went 150 days to the fringe, and every comment below that was like, "Oh fuck you, man!" I haven't really- <laughs> And you're like, well, you've signed up for this. Like, that should be your... You should have that in your mind. I've got that in my mind. I've got a flipping countdown clock on my phone. I know exactly how many minutes it is till the fringe, let alone days. Yeah. uh, Because I've got that. I've got a show to do. Yeah. And um, that should be a push point. So I guess your kids... It's interesting your kids are your driving force, but also would they an impact on you changing career? Because it sounds like you were doing all right. Yeah, doing well. Doing well. And... um, But it... um, Yeah, definitely an influence... At the beginning, they were the things that put me under pressure because obviously you can't just keep burning the candle. I mean, you're a busy guy. You know what it's like. You're doing all this in the daytime, doing all this in the nighttime. And it got to a point where I just thought, this is crazy. I can't commit 100% to the comedy, the thing I want to do, if I keep doing this. So I I wound down um, what I was doing in the daytime and stepped up the evening stuff and just pushed harder. And then now I've taken on more stuff in the daytime that's comedy related. And you just... um, Put, you know keep pushing and keep pushing but yeah you know when you've got kids who are like what am i having in my sandwiches and you say oh, um you're not you know <laughs> when you first start comedy you've just got bread today son then you know that you're maybe not getting as many gigs or decent paid gigs as you uh, as you need so it's nice i mean if i was a, if i was 19 or 20 i'm sure i would be doing less after four years in comedy than now so there was nothing <laughs> i don't want to say it like this but there was nothing for you down here to follow and I was, I was, I suppose it was a dream. Then we'll see. Well, the dream that you want to do comedy, and no, uh, it was. I've always loved comedy. Right. Always loved comedy, and certain things that happened in my life, significantly horrific things that happened in my life before comedy, where I was sat with the wife and thought, it's something I thought about. I've never really even discussed it with her, um, and I just said, I think I'm going to try it. And she went, yeah, because you saw when things really bad things happen in your life, and you've got so many things that you still sort of think oh, I wish that had not happened you think well what's the worst that could happen from trying comedy on a few open mic nights uh, as it turns out nothing bad can happen from it you just it's a different experience and you know and it just that is the way it went I never thought for a minute when I started open mics that I'd get a career out of it maybe six months in I thought you know what there might be something in this um, three or four months in because uh, you know, you start thinking, well, why am I li-? like I've said already? Why am I leaving the kids? Why am I going out when I should be reading them a bedtime story? And um, so, but you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's it's just uh, a constant reminder that you've got to keep keep going and and do better when you've got something 
like an Edinburgh Fringe deadline or a three-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> They're not interchangeable. They're not, they are. <laughs> They're both this, babies. This is my third year, so going up. So I, it's I, a three-year-old. I'm calling this season three anyway, so whether they're not or not. Um, it sound, it's going to sound odd, but do you find it creatively stifling having to do the circuit like that? Because if you've got to go out five, six nights a week and do the same 20 minutes because that's the thing that people book you for, how do you find time to write new stuff or is it a case of you've got that and then you book extra gigs like open spots to do extra material outside of that um creatively stifling i don't think so i don't think so i mean i don't do five or six nights a week um that's a that's a a main a main point i should stress um three to four uh, on average i would say but um it's no not stifling because you know, when you're doing a 20, a paid 20, paid 25, paid 30, and you've got something new in your mind that's happened that day, or you've written something that you think is just magical, um, or gonna is gold, it's generally only going to last 45 seconds, 60 seconds, something like that. So when you've got the luxury of a 25, 30 minute pay spot, that's, I find that's the perfect time to try a new 60 seconds. I don't like going out and doing a 10 minutes of new material. That doesn't work for me. Um, I can't sit down for two hours and write new material. That doesn't work either. It's stuff that just comes to me in the daytimes. And I think uh, I try it on a few mates or the wife or whatever. And then I think, yeah, I think I can, I can risk trying that tonight. And uh, yeah, it might not be a, you know, a critical 25 minute closing spot for some club who are going to hate me because I've died for 90 seconds during it, but it might be somewhere on a Wednesday night where I think I can afford to, try this out in 60 seconds it'll be fine um but yeah not stifling not stifling it's uh i I just uh i've never done enough new material open mic nights to know what it's like the other way around i guess so but i do i i I do know what you're talking about though because i go to when i do pop into london or do some gigs where there's some newer acts i can see that everything they're talking about is completely different to last week when I saw them or when I saw them a month ago and mine doesn't revolve like that you know every I guess my 25 minute set at the minute is I don't know got 30 40 percent different material in it than it did 10 12 months ago so it's not uh, but I guess that's the same for most circuit comedians I guess they're not always kind of breaking what isn't broken are they it's just they're just saying what works on stage and pays the wages yeah <laughs> I'm trying to think of the way to phrase this now. You, you, you said that really well, and it sort of half answered it. Um, let me ask this instead, and then I'll come back to it. It's going to be a great edit. <laughs> um, uh, it's, just, it's, never, it's nothing like this on anyone else's, is it? Um, so you do three to four nights a week. Yeah. Without getting too personal, as a person who has a day job, a night job, a podcast... Uh, a hobby outside of comedy and comedy how do you pay the bills with three four nights do you know like in the nicest possible I mean I'm sure you've lowered costs and, and your wife works and so you split stuff and whatever but from my perspective that that seems like the dream that seems because that means you could do three four nights a week you can go out and then do open spots if you want to learn stuff you can apply for extra bits in the day and yeah I mean the three I mean three obviously the Thursday Friday Saturday night gigs pay well because they're you know opening or you know opening a a chain or it's um it's closing an independent club or it's emceeing a night and that's you know not bad pay and um it's um and as you say the wife works three days a week and um you just uh certainly at the beginning a lot more sensible with money because you can see that there's a risk that next week that gig might get cancelled or whatever i run two gigs myself as well um which are full pro nights full or singing or dancing sort of five six hundred seaters so that probably covers half of my earnings as well at the moment so i can't i can't complain at all um but uh yeah it's i'm not back to where i was before i started comedy with the earnings there but hopefully another year or two and i will be but you just got to keep keep pushing haven't you and keep promoting yourself and keep getting yourself in whatever you know whatever um, PR you can do really okay and how do you I don't want to say brand yourself but how do you pitch yourself to promote it's like if you one of my bugbears especially in London is there's a lot of comedians going for a very small number of spots at pro clubs 
And so you've either got to know that promoter well, they've seen you a couple of times, or you're a famous person, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're not the latter in the nicest possible way. No, I um, it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you probably have connections with some clubs that you've worked for for a bit. Yeah. How did you get to that? I, from at the very beginning, would just send, I would just send my clip and tell, you know, most of the time, just tell them the clubs that I'd done and they would offer me the gigs. I think that it does help having an old face. I've got to be honest. Um, it's amazing how many times I would get a gig, I'd send them a clip, tell them some clubs I'd gigged for and, and what I was doing, and I'd get a gig where I knew that the younger comedians who are my mates who... Um, I believe were better than me weren't getting gigs and I was I don't know back then I don't know um, genuinely why that happened but I think it's probably because they look at me and think this guy's 37 38 he's not going to stitch us up look at his website he's got kids and blah 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 he's trying to earn a I don't know but all I, I remember watching and getting these gigs and just thinking it must be because they think I'm going to be a reliable old guy who's not going to let them down who's not you know going to go and get drunk and, and say phone in sick I don't know but that's I, I remember so many times thinking Christ I don't know I got this gig that's awesome and you know just, it just built from there um, and you get more chances to get in more in front of more and more half decent promoters, and as long as you do get that ninety percent hit rate, because Christ, I've had some weeks where I've had a thirty percent hit rate. You know, you just think, what am I doing? We've, we've I have messed that week. this up <laughs> so badly. You know, and there's still a couple of the bigger promoters who I, you know, thought a year or so ago, have gone, wow, I'm in, and you have a couple of flat gigs, and they won't touch you with a barge pole. You know, and you just think, oh God, but. That's just a learning curve, isn't it? And sometimes, that, I guess, when I look back over the last couple of years particularly, that's the one thing that I suppose is a shame that I felt where I've pushed myself so much. A lot of comedians, I think, will know this, where you push yourself, you get in front of people, you have the chance, and it's too soon. Yeah. And you've done it, and you think, I can do the 20s, I can do the 25s, I'm doing well, I've had a couple of really good weeks, I'm on fire, and you go up there, and you're not. You're yeah. doused completely, and you just think... I'm not ready for this. And that, so I have messed up a few things um, along the way. But um, I, I honestly don't know, Simon, what, what, um, how I pitched it other than as simple and as boring as it sounds. Sent them a decent clip and some, and some references. Well, if you can't answer that, you might as well go. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. That's the main reason we had you on. <laughs> Tell us your secrets. Um, no, I mean, I, I didn't think you were going to go that route with that answer, if you let me, if you don't mind me saying bold, because when you said an old face helps sell it, I thought you meant you look different to the, you know, 20-something male comedians who dominate a lot of the gigs. Oh, now. you mean like as in a, as in a persona? As yeah. In a, oh, okay, well, that would be nice. I'm not, I don't know, actually. Maybe some of the promoters could answer that one, but I... I don't know what. As, so they'll get the line up, and I think like we got a guy who looks like that, and he's got this old guy, and then we have got this girl, and we're doing everything. It's brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. I well, don't think so. Well, well yeah. I'd like to think it would be great if that was true, because you know maybe I've still got some chances where <laughs> where I didn't think I would have, where I'm maybe ticking a certain box. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. When when I chatted to Hills Jager in the first episode, she said when she. I can't remember the word she used. She doesn't schedule gigs. She um, choreographs them. Also, she had like a terminology for it because she yeah. looks at a, a, a few months in advance rather than just one gig at a time. Yeah. And she was like, I try and vary the lineups as much as possible so the punters don't see the same act three months in a row. Yeah. But also they don't get bored that there's like three, you know, women or three men or whatever on the bill. Yeah. So I thought if you'd actively f found that out in other clubs, it would have been interesting. Um, has anyone ever I don't think anyone would ever you would have found out if no one's going to email you and go we need a 40 something <laughs> that would be great wouldn't it but no uh, that, honestly that would be great because starting later on in life you do get some hang ups because you know even you know, even when you do go and do open mics and they're all you know teens and 20s and you start thinking oh blimey I really stick out I'm not sure what chance I've got in this industry because I'm really starting out so late um 
it would be lovely to think that people do think like that. I, uh, I think when you're on the club circuit, it's less of an issue. You know, you're up there on a whatever stage it is, glee, jonglers, whatever. And a lot of the comedians are in their 40s already, or dare I say 50s, who've made it and are, you know, are successful and well-known comedians and they're on that stage. So I don't stick out like a sore thumb. But often on the, some of the lower end uh, gigs that I frequent more often than I do and <laughs> some of the bigger chains, um, there are a lot of, of younger acts. Um, so I probably do stick out a bit more. I suppose it does help with the variety, doesn't it? You've got to you've got to have a varied bill, really. Otherwise, if you just have three twenty, thirty something white guys up there talking the same stuff, it is going to get a bit boring for the audience. You've got to mix it up. Um, so yeah, definitely book forty year old comedians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If there's one thing we get out of this podcast, it's less gigs for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, no, I. It, it sounds really weird. Uh, I. I mean, I don't. I don't think promoters think of it like that, as no. it were. But I do think there's. I mean, especially with the whole uh, women in comedy being more. Uh, What's the word? Monitored heavily. If mm. like if in London in particular, if you don't have like a woman on your bill, sometimes you're you're chastised for yeah, for yeah. not having variety and uh, on on TV shows and stuff. Yeah. You know they say that. So I just wondered if you'd had that, but in a male way. But you can't comment. You don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm not aware of it. I'm not aware of it. I've not I've not ever been on a bill where I've thought, well, I'm definitely the. Uh, the old guy in the group. Well, I've, I've definitely thought that actually, <laughs> but I've not actually thought. I've not actually thought. Well, this is an intentional, clever business um, plan of the promoters to make sure that every bell has got some uh, some oh, dad on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. I feel like the dad of comedy sometimes. Well, not the dad of comedy. That's <laughs> a, hey, I'm the dad of comedy. No, but you know, who's this old guy coming uh, coming on the scene? But um, yeah, no, I, it's. Uh, I got some hang-ups about my age anyway. I already look fifty, but I think um, being uh, being forty and two years into a professional comedy career is uh, is unusual, isn't it? Uh, is there I, anyone it, else? It's no, there are, but they're now not forty. They're either dead or they're like <laughs> in their fifties or sixties. Oh, the future! Uh, yeah, everyone's got death to look forward to, so don't yeah. worry about it. I know that there are. I do know that there are. I mean, people remind me of this all the time when I have a little bit of a down day. Yeah. They'll say, "Oh, you know, John Bishop started late, and you know, Michael McIntyre wasn't twenty, you know, anything." Yeah, but that was the, you know, that was a while back now, yeah. and we're now here. <laughs> 2015 you know so um it's seeing seeing the newer comedians and the comedians have been pro for a couple of years it is few and far between people are in their um late 30s and 40s who are at this stage but you just make of it what you can don't you and you just use your own strengths and skills and i guess mine was coming from you know professional you know business background and just being able to just market myself and you know get myself out there so i was gonna say i mean what kind of marketing were you doing before Oh, marketing of any business at all. So it would literally be, you know, um, managing people's um, websites and uh, their brochures and, uh, you know, um, radio campaigns and posters and you name it, designing and marketing anything, whatever the business demand is. So I understood all of those, you know, um, elements of the marketing mix. And I know that, you know, whatever I do, it's got to look right on the website. It's got to all sound the same on Facebook and Twitter and it's got to all gel and have a, a, a unified persona going across everything. So I suppose that helps me on stage as well, in a way. Well, uh, I'd imagine it helps you more off stage. I mean, for me, I was telling you before, I do a lot. Of, uh, my job is social media in yeah. the daytime, yeah. uh, which I still do, yeah. unfortunately. Um, <laughs> well, I say I enjoy it, but um, it, so I mean, when you started, did you have a brand in? Or did you have like this dad brand? Because even on your website, you've got photos of your wife and your kids and yeah. stuff. Like, are, are you trying to like when you portray yourself on stage? I've watched. I mean, I watched some clips of you and I, I saw your show reels and stuff. And I mean. I don't get a dad vibe from you. I mean, no. I'm, visually I do, in the nicest possible way. <laughs> yeah. But your material isn't 100%, no. you know, it's not my kids said the funniest, that kind of thing. I mean, um, I, the, people, I didn't, but people labelled me as like an everyman at the, early on. Um, Steve Bennett uh, did a, 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 reviewed me, to, which was, it was awful. The only review I've ever had, really, and it was just an awful review of me. Well, his review was brilliant, obviously, but of me being awful and um it, he called me every man and i think that the persona i'm going for is like a an aged 
dude, you know, an aged guy that still thinks he's got it all going on, but is well aware of his weaknesses as he's getting older. I do relate to my marriage and my kids, but so early on, I definitely did. I spoke a lot more about my wife and kids, but as I've um, progressed the persona and developed, it's uh, I'm just talking generally about being a middle-aged man. Um, so yeah, I think early on, you just play to your strengths again, you know, whatever you, whatever you find comes easy to you in your mind um, to write jokes about um, is going to work for you and it's going to be the most believable to the audience when they're watching you. So there's no point in me talking about the cool stuff when they see, like you say, a dad on stage. I don't want to push that I am a dad in their faces for 25 minutes, but it's got to be believable. So, uh, And they've got to feel like they can engage and connect with whatever I'm talking about. So from the very beginning, I knew I had to play to my strengths and got to talk about the stuff that fits this. <laughs> Yeah. Makes sense. So, when it came to branding yourself offline and and getting gigs, yeah, I mean one of the one of the main factors I've come across with promoters is they <clears throat> they want your website to be up to date. Yeah, they want your gig list there so they can see who else you're gigging with. Yeah. They want your your social media presence. They might not use it, but they want to know you're there. Yeah, they want to know what audience you've got. I mean. Did you do like a course in like in comedy, or did you do a course in any kind of marketing as a person rather than as a brand to get this information? No, no. I mean, I did a deg- my degree was in marketing, uh, yeah. and obviously working and my business and everything else made me well aware of how unified the marketing message needs to be. So, from the very beginning, I had a website that pitched me at that point. You know, as that sort of um, that looked like it was a website that was of me you know it wasn't a funky cool website with all the belt you know it looked like a guy who was in his 30s who was promoting himself on a website you know and the, and the messages on the website were the same as they were on other social you know social media twitter and facebook and it was all tied in so like you say it was a unified message and it was um just trying to make it look like i cared about what i was doing like you say you go on I mean, even now i'll book comedians for my gigs and i'll look and i think well this hasn't got any dates listed on this and these guys are on on telly maybe or something and you think wow I can you know I mean they're all clearly talented because they don't need to be as anal about their website as I am <laughs> so they could just doesn't matter doesn't matter I'm hilarious and everyone books me and wants me on telly and um, so maybe they don't need to um, work tirelessly like everyone else does on websites but um it's uh yeah it's amazing how many comedians just don't do that stuff and I just feel like I've really got to because if I let one thing slip, I'm less likely to get booked. I get that. I I have a. I have like four, maybe five channels of content. I'm constantly updating. One yeah. of them is my website, you yeah. know, social media stuff. This and just, just I feel like if I let any of them slip for too long, then I won't. You know, you know, you just sort of go. Well, I'll get back to it at some no, point. Yeah, yeah, and you can't do that. I just, I just, I do stress about it. I do stress about it, and I think, oh God, I have not put something on Twitter for a bit, and or I've not done. You know, I've not I've put those dates on my website since yesterday. And it's like plates, isn't it? Just spinning. I mean, any career is, isn't it? But with comedy, because you're so much in the public eye as far as the audiences might be checking you out from the poster that you're on for tomorrow's gig or whatever, I just feel there's a lot more pressure. And I, I feel like you know, the whole thread of this chat's been so well, really, that I feel the, the pressure for me there is such that I cannot afford anything to slip. Saying that, I mean, there's so many comedians out there trying. I guess pressure's on all of us, isn't it? So you, I think that that is the most critical thing you can do is just keep on top of every single element of your own PR, your own marketing. So because you don't have any management and representation for your live work mm. and you are your own PR and marketing department, mm. when you book a new gig, <clears throat> say, I mean, let's go back to when you just started out. You know, maybe you've been going a year and you've got a bit of a set going. Yep. And you've been me- emailing new clubs to get open mic, uh, open spots, sorry, yep. right? How did you go about researching them to make sure they were not four hours of driving to get to a, like, because you wrote a whole article on stuff that had just pissed you off from, <laughs> do you know, I mean, I think that's fair to say. Um, about half baked comedy nights. Yes, uh, yes, yes. So I assume you'd gone to quite a few shit nights. Yeah. And well, we, we all have, haven't we? Yeah, why not? <laughs> no, my, I mean, my career's doing better than you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in London. I'm in <laughs> I made it. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. I have been to some awful ones, and I think that. At that point, I'd started regularly running a couple of nights, albeit like little nights, 
But again, you know, as a com- yeah, you do know as a comedian what it takes to make a decent comedy night. You know, simple stuff that we all know: stage, spotlight, sound system that works, chairs all facing the same way in a room that isn't distracting anybody apart from the comedy. Um, so yeah, I. I suppose I didn't really. I didn't research the gigs that I was going to to think, like, are they going to be rubbish? But you do, once you've done enough, get an inkling for what gigs are going to be rubbish from just the way it's promoted, from the way that the promoter is, or the person is, should I say. Because often these guys aren't promoters. They're guys who think, oh, this comedy seems to be working well on the telly. I reckon I've got a space at Bob's you know, community hall that we can knock something up on. They've never run a comedy before and they think they could earn a few quid from it. And they're the sort of promoters that, you know, do two gigs and then nothing else happens. Um, and the others are ones that, you know, start growing and growing and really get the hang of how to run a comedy night and learn the lessons that we all learn as well when I'm taking part in these gigs. So, yeah, that's why I did that article because I've done so many. I just thought, oh, everyone else surely must be thinking the same as me. How to run an unsuccessful comedy night. <laughs> well, I, I'll link to it. I, I agreed with most of it, mm? but there was one bit in it that kind of cu- made me curious because you sort of said something like, uh, don't charge at the door. I'm not, I can't quote it completely, but something like, don't charge at the door because everyone's committed to stuff they haven't invested money into or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in London, there are three comedy nights, pro nights. Yeah that uh, pay what you want at the door mm. and especially at the Edinburgh Fringe there's loads of really good shows that pay what you want yeah. was it I mean do you think that's changed do you still think that or did you still think <clears throat> the nights that are charged for tickets naturally around the country I'm, I mean it's a generalisation but yeah. better than the free ones in your opinion from my experience yeah I mean I think Edinburgh is a slightly different animal because the yeah. people are sort of engaged in comedy from the morning yeah. when they wake up yeah. so they want to see some shows this is great and of course they're free to get up and go and find another show halfway through if they're bored of your hour which it might happen at mine I suppose but um, it, yeah I think that open mic nights I mean I've done too many gigs where oh we'll have loads of audience in mate because it's free they're just wandering from the bar and you think oh will they <laughs> oh no um, and and you're getting paid a half decent amount but you know you're not going to be awesome because this is just open to the footy on the telly in the next space of the pub and you know someone's got a fruit machine that's winning the jackpot 10 feet from the stage and it's all so sad when you're up there doing your best and there's so many things like the coffee percolators going off halfway through your setup line you know so I still think that if you get someone to pay something um, to come in, they're less likely to piss about in the audience and they're more on board with listening and enjoying comedy. For, for me, it's kind of, um, it's like it's like Chinese takeaway. Like, I, if, if the price was too low, I'd question what's in it. Mm. So, what do you think is a good, I mean, obviously it'll vary by the quality of the night and the size yeah. of the room and all that stuff. I mean, do you think, do you think like a pound, like just to cover the cost? Or well, it's it, funny you should ask, because I, when I, my first ever gig I did was, uh, set up was at Haven Leisure Centre. I know you're thinking this sounds perfect already, James. Um, <laughs> and it was in its own space upstairs. And because it was a council run venue, they said, we'll subsidize the entrance. So it's just like a quid to get in. And I thought at, at the time I'd be going for like six, eight months. And I thought well, that sounds all right, ideal. Um, and we got quite a few people coming, but slowly it still just dropped away, the audience numbers. Even though the lineups were good and the semi-pro acts and a pro headliner, it just dropped away. And we had no idea really why. But then we realised that just putting a pound on a poster, entrance fee, people automatically decide, this can't be good. It's a quid. What could you get for a quid? You know, pound land comedy night. I mean, it's you just start judging it from the price. Um, I think that when people see four or five quid... They start feeling it in their wallet a bit, you know. They've got a tenner in their pocket for the night, or whatever. Get a pint or two, and a night and a, and comedy. I think they start valuing it a bit more. I think four quid. Whenever I see four quid or more for a local professional comedy gig um, or semi-professional, then they'll start to value it a bit more. Um, Do you, I mean, there's a comedy union that's kind of starting in London. Yeah, I don't know if you've. I've seen the emails and uh, and the attachments and the, seen the bubbles of it on Facebook and stuff. Yeah, Do you I'll think keep gonna... meaning to get to one, but yeah, uh, yeah again, six hour round trip. But um, I think it's any any sort of union where we come together as a group is going to make us you know, more powerful. Is that the word? Yeah, more forthright. So you know, more thrust behind what we believe in and, and what we want from the industry. So it can only be a good thing, can't it? 
Possibly. I mean, I, I'm only playing. I'm playing. Devil's you're not against it. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm playing devil's advocate here, just just to kind of find out a little bit more what you're about. I mean, I, yeah. I'm meant to be going to the next meeting, yeah. and I'm talking to. I'm trying to talk to John Cordillo to get him on this mm. to to talk about it. But I was wondering if you thought that would help or hinder, like especially indie nights that are maybe set up by people who you know haven't got support from the bar but are, are trying their best. They're putting on a night. They're doing all the stuff, and obviously their their wage as much as ours are based around the sales. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know really. I don't know um, enough about the the union sort of plans as to ha- who they will help, or whether they'll help every single person in the industry, or whether it's going to be focused on, you know, the pros and the and the, and the top of the rungs. I don't know, but um, probably why I should get to one of these meetings. <laughs> That's right. Um, so Portsmouth has no comedy. Well, a few well, bits. Okay, start that again for the edit. <laughs> Portsmouth has very little comedy. Yeah. And as I've always said, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I have to do that again for the end. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you can't do this on stage, can you? Like, it's no, just really yeah. Can we just ignore that last one? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, guys, honestly, I'm building to something. It's going to be great. <clears throat> so, Portsmouth. Has... <laughs> it's got weird now. <clears throat> so, Portsmouth has, has a few comedy nights when yeah. you start, like when you started out, and it still doesn't really have much of a scene. And you said that was the primary reason or one of the primary factors to why you started? Is it the Southwest comedy? Just South Coast. South Coast Comedian of the Year. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, it was an idea I had a, right, you know, a couple of years ago and I thought it would be good to have something where South Coast Queens can be recognised for achieving something. I think I... It always used to annoy me as a kid when bands would tour all over the country. They go, and you know, we're doing Cardiff and Manchester. I go, yeah, and I go, and London for you in the south. And you think, no, that's still miles from me. Uh, And you know, some people in the south coast, five or six hours from London. You know, you're going right down to the the deep southwest there. So, I mean, I'm not saying Pompey's a huge amount closer, but it is closer, and it's something for comedians who are based, you know, down here by the water to. uh, to get a title out of and a chance to be on some pro gigs and win win a prize. So um, that's what I was hoping for, to give some comedians a, even the tiniest step up and maybe in a few years' time it might be a competition that pe- more people have heard of in the industry and gives that winner a little bit more opportunity uh, rather than having to travel wherever to go and prove themselves. I mean that's still going to be the case. They're still going to have to spread their spread their wings and get out there and get in front of you know dozens of different promoters. But there's nothing really down here for them to be able to at least get one accolade or one opportunity to show show themselves off. So yeah, there's there's a lot of talk uh, from the industry people I've spoken to about because the thing is we could sit here right now and say um, we're going to set up the Portsmouth Comedian of the Year award. Mm. And then we could go out and find a room, set it up, and it's done. It's we're well, not done, but you know, then you get, get the people, going, yeah. yeah, and we we'll yep. get you three down, and we'll do the heats for the you know very few comedians that are here. <laughs> but the uh, a lot of industry people I've spoken to say so the ones they immediately value in terms of awards are the ones that are set up by other industry people because they're the people who you know they know and they're being impartial. Okay, as a comedian, do you feel? that you I mean obviously you're not judging it so you're not impartial but you're still connected and affiliated and obviously know some of these people and have gigged with them before yep has has that ever come into play or or been affected or or even negatively affected you if if well because I've known some of the competitors um it's affected me slight well I mean it's not no I don't think so I think when I've watched it's difficult when you watch a comedian that you know if they're not doing their best that's the only time when I find it uncomfortable running the competition where I see a comedian going up there and I've seen them smash it and I'm you know they were, were good mates or acquaintances and then they don't and you think oh I would have loved you to have gone through because you really are good and we all know that like we've talked about earlier you know you do nine great gigs and that tenth one that really matters you you cock up um and so you know you sort of want to just say oh no you're still through because you're great and I know you are but you can't let that affect you you just got to let the let the competition sort of process and the audience who vote um take run its course really um but it is a shame when you see people that you know not go through or see people that you know are better even even if you don't know their know them as a person you've seen them do loads of great gigs and then they don't go but they can't you know even though I'm running this competition they're not great are they for for helping 
booster comedian and um you know awards matter in i guess in in every walk of life because you know you've got the you're the best salesman or you're the best coach driver or whatever it is it does help psychologically at the back of your mind when you see them as a bucko with a some sort of accolade um and that's all i'm hoping i suppose is that but the winner will get or even the semi-finalists or the runners-up will at least get some sort of acknowledgement that they're worth a punt because that's all we need is another opportunity to get in the door and get on that stage and impress isn't it yeah hopefully yeah Yeah. i mean so what do you other than networking and obviously it it makes your name synonymous with an award even Mm. though you're not winning it if that makes sense yeah what do you get out of it and what were you aiming on getting out of it I I suppose remembering how tough it was to get gigs when I first Googled Comedy Nights in Portsmouth, that was the initial aim, um, is to just make it easier for other people locally in my home city to actually, you know, get some uh, stage time and um, get an opportunity to gig. I mean, some of the competitors have only done like six or eight gigs before when they step up on that stage. Some have been going for a couple of years, but still might have only done 40 gigs or 60 gigs, you know. Um, so that's all I was trying to do, you know, that I don't get a you know, some sort of sponsorship purse from Foster's who <laughs> sponsorship or anything exciting from it. But um, I'll get stage time myself, obviously, MC and all the heats and the and the final and the semi-finals, and that's all good, and it's only down the road, so that's wonderful. Um, and uh, they're lovely venues, you know, it's Wedgwood Rooms is the final and the Cellars is the heat, so it's all that's all great. And it's a Wednesday night, so, you know, better than a travelling to do a Wednesday night in, in London <laughs> or is for it you, for you yeah. is it <laughs> depends on what gig you do mate <laughs> that's it Twenty's there to see me <laughs> um, well I mean, okay so when I spoke to Kate Copstick about when she was involved in the Perrier Award which is now the Foster's Award she was interestingly vague but specific at the same time I'll link you um, <laughs> to why she doesn't do that anymore and the politics behind the winners at Foster's, especially at Edinburgh, because the people who win that tend to be a certain type of comedian that they maybe wanted to get through. Oh, and they influence the result? uh, Not influence the result, but there's... Because they're nominated by judges, and because because the judges are people who have vested interest in certain companies and TV shows and things. Okay. There's, but she's not. She's an independent freelance writer. Yeah. So when when I spoke to Kate Copstick, she was talking about the politicalness behind Foster's as a sponsor, mm. and how that could impact the results and yeah. who you can have as a judge and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Has that been a factor for you? No, I mean we the our sponsorship with Foster's is a regional thing, so it's not come from some sort of HQ who've said you know we'll do it because we're involved in so much. Com- well, they are. They have said yes through HQ because it's they're, they're involved in it heavily but obviously as a regional brewer um, they're supporting it and supporting it at the venue so that's the that's the um, that's the reason they're involved so they don't have any influence over where the you know how the competition is swayed in any way um, and because the audience vote it's virtually unless they bring a hundred friends with them it's virtually bulletproof with who goes through um, saying that, I do think that a certain type of comedian is suited brilliantly to competitions compared to others in different environments and in, with different audiences. But, you know, you roll the dice and you see what comes out, don't you? It's, it's been really interesting. Last year, we had some great uh, great finals, great finalists through, and everyone who got through was the one I, I was stood at the back of the room thinking, yep, yeah, they should be going through, and they did. So it was great. And this year, we're on Heat 3 on Wednesday, and so far, the the best ones won each heat, so I can't quibble so far. Well done, audience. <laughs> when it comes to the wild cards for this, yeah, are you involved in that? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, because you you know it's you'll sometimes get one person who turns up on their own at the back of the room. Someone's got five friends, and someone's up there doing something that's crowd pleasing. Um, but you know the guys up there doing some awesome material that you just know is just you know it's me the, and the venue manager and if they're third um and they're just great and they've just missed the second place by a point and they've just been brilliant and um you've never heard of them you know that's brilliant when you come across that sort of magical 
um, you know, talent, um, and you're still at the back of them thinking they've got to go through, and then they don't. You just think, well, they've got to be on the wild card shortlist, surely. So every heat, there'll be a contender, and then at the end, we'll have a look at all the points and who it was, and decide who goes through. So it's always good to have a wild card. I think I've got through to semis on so many wild cards that so you've got to have a wild card. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, how? What's the selection process for the judges then? Um, the judges for the final uh, or do you mean as in who I who how do I pick a judge yeah okay um, I this year I w- would want um, a an ideally a booker um, as a judge and a successful comedian um, to be a judge and also the headline act to be the judge and all of those would well, two of those three would be from the South. So, for example, last year we had Angela Barnes, um, who's obviously um, uh, based predominantly in Brighton. Yeah. yeah. And um, we had um, um, Marilyn Nelson um, from, you know, Jonglers and um, Helen Comedy sort of connection um, and promoter and, and booker come down and judge as well. And Chris Purchase um, come down as well. So someone who was recently turned pro, um, a booker, a promoter, and um, a big, you know, big headline name, and that will be the same this year. Um, we've got uh, Aidan Goatley, who's from Brighton, who's doing wonderful things with his solo show. He's going to come, and um, a headline act yet to be confirmed. Um, but uh, yeah, it, I think it's important that we have someone with a lot of industry knowledge and experience, and a comedian, ideally. Um, who is in amongst it with the gritty sort of pro end? Someone like someone like Aiden or Chris Purchase, and then a successful um, comedian, ideally from the area as well. So we're going to find someone like Angela for this year. Don't know who yet though. Fair enough. Um, one last thing: when you say term pro, that mean I feel like that means something different in London to here. Does okay. that mean you make a hundred percent of your money through stand up or from some sort of promoting? I look at it as meaning you don't do a job that isn't comedy related. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> because, or you give up a day job. Do you know what I mean? Because for me, when I stopped my other staff and started comedy, I wasn't doing promoting or anything. I just kicked that into touch and, you know, off we went. And then obviously running a club or two which meant I could do some gigs locally was great and then as you evolve those clubs or develop the idea of running a club you make more money from it and you know great um I think that's for me that's key I mean obviously turning pro is you make the majority of your living from being paid for performing on stage um but you need to I think um fill in some gaps sometimes with your earnings from other things that you might do that are also comedy related so some people will do some acting work and you know some extras work and popping up here or there and everywhere to subsidise their income so yeah that's what I consider to be turning pro anyway okay and if you had one bit of advice for a London act let's say <laughs> no just just I mean I'd love to say just an act but the, the variances around the country for different acts and different problems they have in their cities mm. Everyone, everyone's got a thing to moan about in their city if that mm. makes sense about yeah, comedy yeah, yeah. they all see the grass as greener which it not always is and sometimes you know what I mean it depends on what you want yeah. really so if you had a bit of advice for someone other than put pressure on yourself and put, be motivated and <laughs> yeah. do Push you know harder, harder. Remember, remember you're on your own and <laughs> fucking pull your finger out kind of, <laughs> what would it be um, have kids <laughs> yeah, that's it. Have a baby and then... No, I think it's something that's recently come to our mind, talking more to London Acts, and is that is um, just get out there. Get out from wherever you are and perform somewhere else. So all over the place, where, as much as you can, which I think will mould your you as a person, you as an act, a lot more than if you just stay. I suppose that's really why I was lucky with Portsmouth is because there's not much here it forced me to go to Yorkshire it forced me to go a little bit into London you know Essex and Gloucester and Wales and South West and just gig in every different environment and every different experience you can have as a comedian that would be my one tip I think because if you can get out there and you're you're more likely to I think start getting some paid stuff Um, you're more likely to develop um, first and foremost your um, your persona, your writing, your act, because 
there's no point in just being in front of the same sorts of audiences night after night after night same and I think that's what happens when you get stuck in a city even a city like London I think you you want to you know the minute you go to a different city you'll see a whole different audience uh, a whole different class of people a whole different you know type of uh, type of other comedian who might have travelled from bloody Newcastle to come and do a gig in uh, Northampton and you've travelled up and you know you're seeing a whole different a whole different world of comedy I think so yeah just get out there and spread your wings a bit cool well thanks for coming on <laughs> All right, no yeah. worries loved it yeah cool that was James I had I had a lot of fun talking to him as you can probably hear we got on really well and if you are someone who is thinking about entering his competition please do um, I uh, the, like I said I think I don't know what time you're listening to this um, but if you're listening to it in around September uh, 2015 when it came out or September any year that is when he opens up the that is when he opens up applications for people to take part in it so if you are listening to this in September or you're just interested in competitions around the circuit and you just want to know a bit more about it you know just have a look and look on the website uh, there's links in the show notes for all of that if you have enjoyed this please do share it with a friend uh, like us please do share it with a friend I think it'd be really useful for anyone who is on the south coast who is looking for a competition to do that is specific to their area of the country also anyone who is looking at doing competitions and wants to hear more from the people that run them and why they run them uh, also it would be great for new comedians who are looking at starting out who are wondering how hard it is to make it as a clubbing comic and um, what you have to kind of give up for that and uh, I really enjoyed I really enjoyed talking to him about how for me I'm trying to make an audience for shows and he's trying to get just more circuit work and I know you can do both at the same time but for me they feel like two completely separate disciplines and as a result I want to focus on one and he seems to have focused on the other it's just interesting to to think about those kind of things from the business end now if you're enjoying these podcasts please please do one of these things to support me uh first of all you can share it with people as I just said two you can leave it a review on iTunes please uh leave it the honest review you think it's worth if you think it's worth four stars do that I'm not going to be I'm not going to hunt you down if you think it's worth four stars but if you think it's worth five that would be amazingly helpful also if you can leave a little bit of a written review that would be really useful as well um if you would like to financially support the podcast or you've got anything out of this and it saved you some time and effort or you've just or it's just provided you a bit of company on a uh, drive home from a gig please do consider giving me a donation you can do it at you can do it at simoncain.co.uk that's s i m o n c a i n e.co.uk there's a paypal button in the top left or right hand corner the one of i think the left is the paypal button and the right is the patreon button which brings me to the next way you can support the podcast if you would like to become a patron, please do. Um, you can do it from $1 a pod. The reason it's in dollars, by the way, is because the site that I am doing it with is American, and they so far do not offer you the facility to do it in I- English money. So um, that's the only reason why it's in dollars. But it doesn't cost you anything different. It just you know comes out of your account as normal. So if you want to donate 80p an episode uh, or more, that would be great. Uh, I'm just trying to get us up to our next target for that so that uh, I can be less anxious about doing these because I have a budget behind me. So if you want to support, that would be amazing. Uh, if you don't want to support in any of those ways, please join the Facebook group. It's called Ask the Industry Podcast and it is obviously on Facebook. And that is <laughs> that is slowly becoming a catchphrase because for some reason I feel the need to say it like it's sort of default now, like a, like a muscle memory joke. Um, but yeah, do join up to the Facebook group uh, in there we're always having discussions it's also the place where two maybe three days before a confirmed guest I'm going to interview is going to come on I ask what would you like to ask them so if you know any of my upcoming guests or you don't know the upcoming guests but you want to be kept in the loop of who I am interviewing and you would like to ask questions to the guests that is the best place to do it because that is the place that I'm trying to house all those conversations and back and forths between everyone so please join and that again that's free and it's just a closed group to stop spammers really and yeah it's really cool and you'll find out all kinds of stuff that i've got going on in there so please join anyway thank you very much for listening thank you very much for sharing thank you very much for donating and i'll see you in about a week bye